Greetings everybody, my name is Tommy the Game Master and welcome to my channel. After playing through the Tomb Raider reboot a few months ago, I decided to go ahead and give the classic Tomb Raider franchise a try. I did already own Tomb Raider Anniversary, so I picked up the other two recent games that go with it. Well, recent in almost a decade old. And I also guess not realizing it that these were actually part of another reboot trilogy. Yes, Laura Croft has been rebooted just as many times as Spider-Man. Only difference is she actually completed her second trilogy. Also, her first reboot was more of a softer reboot. Starting with the remake of the original game and only changing some of her character to match. Basically, in the original, she was a daredevil adventurer slash archaeologist because she was basically just a thrill seeker. Here, she's still a thrill seeker, but there's a point to all of it. She's trying to find out what happened to her missing parent. Anyway, since I made a video when I first got it complaining about how it didn't work with my controller, a video I do not regret making it, I bought a game and it didn't work. There was no help on Steam or Square Enix's site, and if a person in a comic session hadn't alerted to me about that the particular bug was in Steam and how to solve it, I would probably have refunded this and maybe sought it out on a PS2 copy after I finished the other games. Anyways, with it fixed and actually having decent controls with the Xbox controller, I decided to give this game a go first. And, um... Sorry any PC fanboys that I pissed off with making that video because I was pissed that my controller wouldn't work. To me, a third person action game like this needs an analog stick. A keyboard and mouse does not cut it for me. The game opens up with Laura's mansion being completely obliterated and her friends thinking she's out to attack them. It then immediately cuts back to a few weeks earlier and Laura starting out on her next quest, trying to find the entrance to the Norse underworld. She believes that her mother somehow managed to find a way down there and she's interested in checking it out to see if she's still alive or not. After a few misadventures and some underwater ruins and no, it's not lost on me that the first half hour of the game is spent looking at Laura Croft's ass. She finds out that an old rival has captured Natla, who was the villain of the first game. While I may have only played about 15 minutes or so of Anniversary before starting this, I kind of knew she was the villain. I do believe a rich woman looking for ancient artifacts with overly long fingernails contacting the hero about all of this is going to betray the hero eventually, just kind of like the old father figure that is accompanying you into danger is probably going to die before the end. That said, the bat wings did surprise me just a little bit. Didn't expect her to have bat wings. Anyways, Natla tells Laura the location of all the tombs that hold the artifact relating to Thor's hammer, an item she needs in order to get into the underworld. Okay, having played through the remake, I noticed one of the big changes in the two games. While the remake did involve plenty of parkour and jumping around, its main focus was on the gunplay. It was designed to give people an action thrill ride experience. This one has a lot more puzzle elements to it, and bigger areas in a way that these dungeons are made, at least when it comes to navigating and figuring them all out. The best way I could describe it is the Prince of Persia Sends at Times series means Zelda Twilight Princess's dungeon design. The levels and labyrinths are quite huge and come in multiple parts, usually an outside part with Laura trying to sneak in, a middle part which is just below the surface, and then a dungeon that is kind of from this precursor era that Laura is trying to find these relics in. And after you go through most of these giant labyrinths and she claims the prize she's looking for, she oftentimes has to figure a way out, and hey boy, that can be hard having to retrace your steps through the same maze. It's not something you expect from a game like this. You usually expect you find that item and then you're teleported out. Anyways, like I said before, puzzle elements. Here it's about navigating the tombs and figuring out ways over obstacles 
using Laura's platforming skills. This means finding areas on the walls to latch onto, climbing things, what she can balance on, what she can't balance on, and oftentimes having to trigger devices that might lower or rise platforms so she can reach the next goal. Basically like the Prince of Persia series, your main goal is figuring out how to get around. But there are a few puzzles that have to be solved, like pushing boxes or hitting switches in order to get around them. And yeah, I'll admit to each tomb took several hours for me to complete the first time, as failure oftentimes means watching Laura fall to her death. But at least we find out that the rest of her bounces as well. I can see why people do like to speedrun these games. After you know the puzzles, getting through them is actually pretty easy and there are probably multiple variations to get through them. Anyways, while some puzzles can be really frustrating, a lot like a good Zelda dungeon though, nothing makes you happier than when you finally figure these things out and make your way through them. So what about action and gunplay? Uh, unlike the reboot, it's not really the main thing. Most of the time you're drawing your weapon on wildlife, with the occasional mercenary sent to stop Laura showing up and trying to take her down. There is very little if any blood in these fights and they're kind of just basic action sequence. Again, the platforming and the puzzles are the main action here in this game. Still, Laura can equip herself with one of several options like a shotgun or an assault weapon next to her dual pistols which never run out of ammo but are fairly weak. That said, later stages do have some action scenes when zombies start getting added to the mix. Unlike the Tomb Raider reboot, whose Onis were undead, but just as easily killed by bullets. Why were a 1942 Japanese army squadron afraid of these guys again if they can just be put down with regular bullets? These guys, however, can't. You After you take them down, you have to jump on them and turn them into dust and if you get a bunch of these guys around these poison pools and they do like to gather around these and around them and you're going to get yourself into some really tight situations towards the end when you have to get out of some of these labyrinths after these guys start popping up and while the last stage is definitely zombie central by that point you will have Mjolnir and be worthy of the power of Thor Hey, bad guys, do you have a Hulk? What? You don't? Sucks to be you. Yeah, the hammer kind of makes using a gun completely pointless. Unlimited ammo. Never has to be reloaded and sends bad guys flying. Now, if I only had to figure out how to throw this thing and have Laura latch onto it so she can fly, it would be perfect. She never does learn how to do that trick, though. In the end, I did enjoy my time with Tomb Raider Underworld. Some of the dungeons and puzzles were a bit on the tricky side that I had to quit and cool off for a while, and in some cases even consult a guide, but overall it was fun and definitely worth $10. Since I mentioned it in my response to extra credits video, yes, the graphics are PS2 quality, upscaled just a little bit. But there are really good PS2 quality, and they did immerse me in the game just as much, I think, as some of the detail that was in the Tomb Raider reboot. Laura has a decent face with some good animations, the graphics run smooth, and the environments are varied and nice. Some odd textures every once in a while, as Laura does occasionally do things like go through things and glitch. But given the age and the hardware it was originally made for, it's not too surprising that some of these things happen. The music is okay, but nothing I found really memorable. Still, the voices in the game are pretty good when it comes to the acting. Nothing wrong with the soundtrack or anything, it's just not very memorable, but most of the sounds basically just have to do with platforming in our environmental, so... Music and sound didn't impress me, but it didn't disappoint me either. I warned you that conveniently undiscovered islands would be scarce in the Mediterranean. Are you sure this Eddington chap knows what he's talking about? So, how was my first outing in the classic Tomb Raider series? Well, I found it really fun. The platforming was enjoyable. The puzzles, although a bit obtuse sometimes, nonetheless gave me a feeling of accomplishment when I was done with them. 
The story, although a little bit predictable, was still a surprising amount of fun. I paid a dollar with this on Steam while it was on sale, and I think I got my money worth. On Steam, it usually goes for around $10, and I do recommend a purchase if you enjoy these kind of platformers. If you don't want to pay $10, put it on your wish list and wait for a sale. It's usually deeply discounted to only a dollar or two. Definitely worth picking up and trying. I enjoyed this game. Let's find out what Tomb Raider Anniversary is like. <laughs> 